good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome for me to this session. And I have the real pleasure of introducing Lord Adair Turner. And I'll give just a bit of brief overview of his um, outstanding career, so I hope I can still do it justice. So Lord Turner is the chair of the Energy Transition Commission, a global coalition of major power and industrial companies, investors, environmental NGOs and other experts working to find pathways to limit global warming while stimulating economic development and social progress. Lord Turner has a background in the financial sector, having chaired the UK's Financial Services Authority and played a leading role in the post-crisis redesign of global banking and shadow banking regulation. He has held high profile roles in public policy, including very importantly, uh, being the first chairman of the Climate Change Committee between 2008 and 2012. He became a crossbench member of the House of Lords in 2006 and previous business roles include um, work at McKinsey, Merrill Lynch Europe and Standard Charter, amongst others. So welcome, Lord Turner, and thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to hand over to you so you can share your thoughts on the <coughs> imperative of accelerating progress towards net zero. Marta, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great uh, to have the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with you. Um, the question that's been posed is, can we keep 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, alive? Can we keep that as a possibility? So let me just start with a few key facts which uh, you know, frame the challenge. Um, first of all, one has to say that the objective is not definitively to keep it alive or not. It's a probabilistic uh, issue because the whole of climate is probabilistic. So when we talk about what is needed to keep 1.5 degrees alive, what we and the International Panel on Climate Change are actually measuring is what do we have to do to have a 50-50 chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. We start with total global emissions from the energy sector, the land use sector, and including both CO2 and an estimate of the equivalent of other gases of about 50 gigatons per year, of which 40 gigatons in the energy building industry and transport sectors, and 10 in the land use food uh, agriculture uh, sectors. Broadly speaking, to limit global warming to uh, uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade to have that 50-50 chance. We need to reduce that 50, uh, of which about 35 to 40 is the CO2 element. We need to reduce that to zero by 2050 or 2060. But actually, just as important, we need to front load that reduction. If we concentrate just on CO2, and we can uh, work with a figure of about 40 gigatons per annum of, of CO2 emissions, the IPCC says that to have a 50-50 chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, total uh, uh, cumulative emissions from 2020 to 2050 of CO2 must not exceed 500. And of course, the eagle eyes uh, amongst you would have realized that if we started with uh, 40, and ended up with zero, and we simply did that as a straight line uh, over 30 years, uh, that would be 600. It would be a half of a, uh, a 40 plus zero, 20 times 30 years, uh, 600. So what that tells you immediately is we've not only got to get all greenhouse gases to around net zero by 2060, CO2 to around net zero by 2050, but we've got to front load that reduction with something like a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions or even a 40% during the 2020s. And we've got to do that uh, in a challenge where every year it's getting more difficult because, frankly, we've had two years of this decade from 2020, these three decades uh, from uh, 2020 to 2050, and it's still running at 40 gigatons CO2 per annum, 50 all gases together uh, per annum. So of that 500 budget, you know, 80s gone already. The challenge gets, gets bigger over time. Now, I'll end up by saying whether I think we're going to meet it. But with that scale of the challenge uh, set out, let me say a few words on which bits of what I've just described I think we can be confident about and where I'm worried. 
I'm going to start by saying that if we concentrate on the energy building industry and transport sectors of the economy, leaving aside land use, food, agriculture, on that EBIT sector, as we call it, energy building industry and transport, I'm actually very, very confident that the world can get to zero emissions by 2060 or even 2050. And I'm far more confident than I was when I was the first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee from 2008 to 12. And the fundamental reason why I'm so confident is that we have had a revolution in technological possibility and the economics of key technologies, which I have to say at the CCC back in 2008, we did not anticipate how rapidly progress would have been made. That progress has been most dramatic and has had the earliest effects in the electricity sector of the economy. Back in 2008, we still thought that to build a zero carbon electricity system, you would have to rely on three different categories of technology, renewables, but also fossil fuels plus carbon capture and storage, including even coal plus CCS at that stage, and nuclear. But what has happened, and it really happened in the 10 years after we were working, is this extraordinary fall in the cost of wind and solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, the cost down across the world, 60, 70, 80, and in the case of solar, down 90%. And just as a word, there has been a slowdown of those cost reductions and even slight a reversal with the supply chain difficulties of the first year. But we're very confident that long-term trend is continuing, particularly in solar over the next few years, where do not be surprised to be surprised uh, when you see the solar costs coming thumping down uh, even faster than before. What that fall in the cost of renewable energy uh, systems has uh, uh, meant is that we can now set out to build electricity systems which are zero carbon by as early as 2035, which is the UK target, and the Labour Party is talking about accelerating that uh, to 2030. That is doable. They will be systems which are as much as 70 or 80 percent dependent on variable renewables, and increasingly we know what are the mechanisms why, by which we will balance the system and deal with that last 15, 20% that needs to be stored or flexible. So the good news, and it is good news that we didn't know at the Climate Change Committee back in 2008, is we know what the solution is to zero carbon electricity systems, which can be achieved faster and at a lower cost than we dared hope back in 2008. Once we at the Energy Transition Commission had really convinced ourselves that that was the case, which we did in 2016 and 17, in the first two years of our operation, we then decided to switch tack and look at what people had called the hard to abate sectors of the economy or the difficult to electrify or impossible to electrify sectors of the economy. I'm talking about steel production, cement, chemicals, long distance aviation, long distance shipping, trucking rather than passenger cars. And we looked at those in detail in 2017-18 and we produced a report end of 2018 called Mission Possible. And the report says what it says on the tin, as it were, that we do believe it's mission possible to get all of those sectors of the economy to net zero by 2050 and at a lower cost than we previously thought uh, was possible. We can talk later if you want about what the technologies are. Hydrogen has a very major role to play. Uh, this, for instance, is 100 grams of zero carbon a, a steel production made at SSAB's a, a hydrogen direct reduction plant uh, in northern uh, Sweden. And what we have seen, for instance, over the last five years is a revolution of thinking in the steel industry. Only five years ago, when we started that work, if you'd asked me, I would have said the future of steel when we decarbonize it is going to be continuing to use coking coal, but adding carbon capture and storage. We now believe that coking coal plus carbon capture and storage will play almost no role in the decarbonization of steel, and that how we are going to decarbonize steel is moving to either hydrogen direct reduction 
or moving through intermediate stages, such as using natural gas, which, of course, is split into CO2 and H2, uh, syngas, uh, before you use those as the reduction agents. As I say, across all of these sectors of the economy, steel, cement, chemicals, long distance aviation, shipping, we can set out what are the technologies that can get us to net zero. And what has been extraordinary and I think heartening is the revolution of ambition. If you had talked to almost anybody in the global aviation industry only five or six years ago about what their target for 2050 should be, there have been a lot of sort of, you know, sucking on lemons and sour faces. This is incredibly difficult for us. Yes, we can improve efficiency. If you really want us to get to zero, oh, 50% is going to have to be done by fundamentally planting forests and having offsets. We can't possibly get to zero in ourselves. But now we have a lot of the global aviation industry signed up to net zero, real net zero by 2050 with a use of uh, synthetic fuels and uh, biofuels, uh, electricity and hydrogen at the shorter distance. So across all of those sectors of the economy, we think it's possible. So basically, over the last 15 years, since I started work at the Climate Change Committee, I have become more confident that in the energy building industry and transport sectors of the economy, can we get to net zero by 2050 across the world? Yes, we can. But I'm still very worried. Why am I worried? I'm worried because although zero by 2050 is possible, it's much more difficult to get, say, a 40% reduction by 2030. And the fundamental problem is the problem of capital stock turnover. Ships last 30, 40, 50 years. Even if you get to the stage where all the new container ships in the world are switching over to the new potential technologies of burning methanol or ammonia, it's going to take a couple of decades before the majority and eventually all the ships in the world are on those new technologies. This fundamental problem of capital stock turnover means that the challenge of meeting what we have to do in the area under the curve, the cumulative emissions, is far more difficult than actually being confident that we can get to net zero by 2050. The second problem is the food and land use sectors. Uh, about 10, 12 gigatons, less certain than the figures for EBIT for two reasons. One, a lot of it's about land use change, and those are somewhat uncertain estimates. And another big bit is about methane emitted by uh, cattle and sheep. And there is a a, a uncertainty, there's a debate about what is the best mechanism to express methane uh, in CO2 equivalent terms. And I could give you an answer which would make that a uh, food and land use sector not 10 to 12 gigatons, but 20 gigatons. And I, I could defend that as well. But let's assume it's 12 gigatons. The challenge is that there are not yet the straightforward technological answers where I can put hand on heart and say, I'm certain we're going to get there. The fundamental driver of that 10 to 12 gigatons is red meat consumption. That is what is producing the methane. That is what is producing the vast majority of the destruction of the rainforests of the world. And I think until and unless we either get significant diet change or new technologies, such as new feeds for cattle or synthetic meat, then I don't think that this is a winnable fight. And it worries me far more than the issues of can we get steel to net zero? Can we get our electricity system to net zero? So our fundamental problems are the pace at which we can take the EBIT sector and the fact that we do not yet have definitive answers in the food and land use sector. And all of that means that if we are to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we will have to have some category of removals as well. Um, if we had started, and we could have started on this uh, journey 20 years ago, more aggressively, we would not have to depend on renewables uh, removals. But from where we are at the moment, we can't make the numbers add up without assuming somewhere between 70 and 200 gigatons of removals over the next uh, 30 years, and then an ongoing stream of removals of maybe three or four gigatons uh, ever 
uh, thereafter. Those could come from nature-based solutions, reforestation, or at a later stage from direct air capture uh, and storage. And there is also a possibility, of course, bioenergy uh, and carbon capture and storage. So we do need that as part of the story as well. So that's what we would need to do to make 1.5 degrees alive. What do I really believe in my heart of hearts? I think the world is going to warm by 1.8 degrees centigrade. I think we're going to have to try bloody hard even to meet that. But I think still think we should uh, keep the target as being 1.5. And we need to be aware that every 0.1 degree centigrade that we overshoot 1.5 is a huge problem. We're at the moment at about 1.2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, and we are seeing very, very big climate effects across the world. They will get worse as we go to 1.5. They will get worse still if we go to 1.8. They will be catastrophic if we go to where we could end up, uh, which is 2.5 or higher. So we need to keep aiming to that target of 1.5 degrees centigrade. But if you ask me in my heart of heart, we will overshoot it somewhat, but I want to keep that overshoot as small as possible. So thank you very much. Very happy to uh, take uh, Marta's questions and I think questions uh, from mm -hmm. all of you as well now. Thank you. Thank you for sharing such a, a clear and, and I guess powerful summary of where we stand on, on climate change uh, and the challenges we're, we're facing. Um, I'd like to start uh, then by asking about your impressions on um, the recent COP, COP27. What is your take on, on the outcomes of the negotiations and um, you know, what, what do you think is a must for COP28? I think in terms of the international politics of climate and the formal commitments, the negotiated commitments, to be blunt, COP27 was not all that important. So we came out of COP26 with, at the end, a set of historic commitments, a commitment that we would phase down coal. That was a hard fought a, uh, debate at the end of the Glasgow conference between phase down and phase out. We ended up for the first time uh, with the final statement of a COP saying that the aim should be 1.5. We ended up with a broad commitment that countries should bring forward uh, new national determined contributions which are compatible with 1.5. And then it was handed on to the Egyptians to take that forward. Frankly, there was not at Sharm el Sheikh in uh, Egypt in November, extensive uh, discussion of that tightening of uh, the uh, uh, NDCs. There really wasn't a stock take on where we are against that 1.5 degree uh, target. What there was, there was a lot of debate about climate finance, and that is important, the flows of finance that are required to enable parts of the low-income developing world to make this transition. There were broad commitments, but not much in detail about dealing with what's called loss and damage and helping on uh, resilience. But on the mitigation agenda, internationally, uh, in international diplomacy terms, there wasn't really a step forward or change from COP26. What there was, I have to say, that I felt uh, at uh, COP27 was a lot of private sector confidence in the technologies. I, I came away, frankly, on the mitigation side, there wasn't much to, to react to uh, on at COP27, but I kept on meeting you know, people running major cement companies in the world who were far more ambitious than I had previously anticipated about the pace at which they could get to net zero. Uh, people who had new technologies in uh, desalination, people who were uh, talking about huge ambitions in the green hydrogen space. So I think there was steps forward there. As we go forward to COP28, and I'm uh, going down to Abu Dhabi next week to uh, meet the newly uh, appointed uh, CEO of COP28, uh, uh, Adnan uh, Amin, who used to uh, run the International Renewable Energy uh, Association. As we move forward to COP28, I think uh, the UAE has a, a fairly clear vision of what it wants to achieve. It is saying that they want to really work out what are the transformative technologies which can keep 1.5 degrees alive. I think inevitably in Abu Dhabi, 
uh, which is where we will be in the UAE, there will be a lot of debate about what is the role of oil and gas. The president of COP28, Dr. Sultan, is also the CEO of ADNOC. Uh, and I think we will see a lot of comment uh, from the NGOs, the environmental NGOs, about that fact. And clearly, you know, the, uh, the UAE believes that there is a future significant role for oil and gas, but also believes that they and the rest of Middle East must move beyond it. So I think for the first time, there will be a real focus as this COP on, OK, what is the pace at which oil and gas production has to decline? And how are we going to get that uh, decline in a world where the easiest thing is for each individual country to say, I absolutely accept that oil and gas a uh, demand and supply globally must decline. But it just so happens that my oil and gas is part of uh, the remaining uh, small percentage that will still be produced. I think that's going to be a, a big and complex and very interesting debate uh, at COP28 in December. Right. OK, so it sounds like there's certainly a, an imperative for governments to, to do more. Um, and it's, it's great to hear that the corporate ambition is uh, is what is seeming seemingly higher. Um, so on that, um, can I ask you then for your opinion on the UK government's plan for for its own net zero by 2050? I would say that there are parts of the UK uh, target uh, which are absolutely I think the target is good. I think the intermediate targets uh, set out in uh, the Climate Change Committee budgets, which have been accepted by government and in our NDC uh, contribution for uh, I think it's 78 percent reduction versus 1990 levels by 2035. I think they're good targets and I think they're deliverable. Um, I think in terms of have we got the policies in place, it's very different sector by sector. So I would say in the electricity sector, I'm confident the UK by 2035 will have near zero carbon electricity. I've just uh, checked on my app uh, the instantaneous figure right now. Uh, we're at 111 grams uh, per kilowatt hour of electricity, if you've, uh, um, which is powering all our machines at the moment. When we started at the Climate Change Committee in 2008, that was 495 was the average uh, for the year. The average for the year last year was about 220. It will be below 200 uh, this year. And I think it will just go down and down. We have clear plans. We know that the absolute core of the UK electricity system is going to be offshore wind. Uh, we will develop 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, maybe as much as 100 by uh, 2050. So will we have close to zero carbon electricity, let's say below 30 grams per kilowatt hour by 2035? I think we will. Uh, I think we've got the policies in place. And if anything, there may be a debate about accelerating that. I think we will electrify passenger road transport. We are now committed to no internal combustion engines to be sold uh, of, uh, after 2035 and none which are not hybrid uh, after uh, 2030. Uh, that will occur. The charging networks will be built uh, by 2040. A very significant share of our stock uh, will be a, a, a electric vehicle. Not only will we be getting the benefits of lower carbon emissions, our major cities will be just much nicer places uh, to be uh, in an environment where we don't have these noisy, smelly things called internal combustion engines. And by the way, our children are going to go look back on us and our stories of, the, the, well, our grandchildren of these things called internal combustion engines with the same pity that we look back on our parents or grandparents who had to deal with the London smogs of the, uh, the pre-1950s. So we will get there on that. Um, the biggest thing I'm worried about in the UK path to net zero is residential heat. Uh, I'm going through the process. I'm just going down to see my country cottage this afternoon uh, where we are at last getting uh, a heat pump uh, installed. It is working. It looks very good. Um, it's taken me 18 months to identify a, a, a small enterprise that I can trust to install it, uh, to get into their queue to, you know, we first discussed it. We first got a quote nine months ago. They're just installing it now. And I think the government has not yet gripped the scale of the supply chain development, 
that 200,000 or more electricians and plumbers and other small trades that we will need in order to drive uh, the improved insulation and the heat pump installations uh, of residential heat. So that, to me, is the big missing bit of the story of how we can credibly meet uh, our targets, along, I would also say, with the agricultural sector. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess also the, in that residential heat, there will come all the issues around taxes, cost to consumers. Like how how does it get funded and and all of that? Um, but let's let's uh, dig a, a little bit further then into the other challenging area that you just mentioned now for the UK, but also for for the world, um, the, the food and agriculture systems, and in particular the issue of um, deforestation. I was looking up some statistics and um, the 2022 forest declaration assessment um, shows that still about 10 million hectare, hectares per year are lost. Um, the rate of decline has started, but it's still very short of the 10% annual required for, to end deforestation by 2030. Perhaps there's, there's some hope now that um, Lula da Silva is back uh, in Brazil. Uh, but what what do you think is necessary then to to stop deforestation? You mentioned red meat. Well, look, let's let's be clear. There's been a set of commitments over time to end deforestation, but so far they they have not get there. Um, one of our biggest problems, of course, over the last five years, have we had a president of Brazil who didn't really uh, believe in stopping deforestation at all. So that has been a, a major problem, and it's greatly welcome that we now have uh, President Lula back, who does. Uh, a, a care about it. But I do think we have to go back to the absolute fundamental economics of what is going on here. The vast majority of deforestation has to do with red meat production. People sometimes talk about you know, mining uh, in the forest and they sometimes say, well, where are we going to get the, the manganese, the cobalt, the nickel? The fact is that the land area taken up uh, by all the mines we will ever need is an absolute pinprick pinprick on uh, the forests uh, of the world. There's a problem that sometimes those man's mines are a vector of development where you build a road to them and then that road itself uh, creates a harmful economic development around it. But in their land area themselves, mining is not the key issues at all. The absolute key issue, which is leading to uh, deforestation, is the clearing of forests either for the grazing of capital, cattle, or for soya bean uh, uh, to feed cattle. That is what is going on. Um, we have to face the fact that given the increase in red meat demand, which is going across the world, there is an economic proposition, a short-term economic proposition that people can make a lot of money out of, which involves clearing forests and handing them over to direct or indirect red meat production. That's a fundamental fact. Now, you can try and offset that by purchasing a lot of offsets and saying, I'm going to try and pay people not to deforest. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, as a philanthropy, I'm going to buy forest and stop it being used. But of course, the danger, if you fundamentally still got that economic demand, is all you do is re you, re you shift the deforestation to somewhere else in the forest. So I do think we've got to come back to this fundamental economic demand. As long as we have increasing red meat demand, and as long as the only way that we know to deal with that is animal meat uh, production uh, through the mechanisms that we are using at the moment, we will have an economic pressure uh, for deforestation, uh, which is, uh, you know, we're sort of entering into an arms race against that when we try and buy credits to offset it. We will be producing in March estimates of how much money the world would have to produce in those offset purchases uh, in order to countermand that fundamental economic demand. I'm not going to reveal them now, but I can tell you, you will be shocked by the size of them. They are so large that they feel almost incredible. So I do think we have to return to the fundamentals here. Um, is there a synthetic meat revolution? Are there other ways of making uh, red meat uh, diets less productive of methane or less uh, demanding uh, of uh, uh, soya and other feeds? Uh, or can we get significant 
reductions, not elimination, but significant reductions in red meat consumption. But I do think we all have to face honestly uh, this uh, problem rather than signing up at COP after COP to a set of commitments to stop deforestation where we simply have not previously faced the scale of the money uh, which would be required to do that if we still have that demand for red meat consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it will be really good to see the the new analysis being that, that is going to be launched, as you just said. Um, I, I think there's there's a little bit of more positive, um, let's say, pressure and, and another positive lever of, of change on the first station, which is the fact that the SBTI, the Science Based Target Initiative, has um, recently published the, the guidance for the flag se sector, forest land and agriculture, and for any company that wants to have their targets validated um, by the SBTI, they do have to sign a no deforestation commitment, uh, whereby by 2025, there, there can't be any deforestation um, in their operations or value chain. Of course, the challenge is the nature of- No, no, um, and, and, the, and that's absolutely great. I think yeah. if all the meat producers of the world sign up to that, and if red meat demand continues to go up, there will be an increase in the price of red meat because you will be removing uh, a cheap form of resource mm -hmm. to, re to produce it. And, and by the way, that's fine. That may be how the system yeah. balances. If everybody says no deforestation and you try to produce red meat without that deforestation, then market economics tells us uh, that either the price will go up, which in itself may help moderate demand, or the price will go up and that will stimulate the technological development. So, you know, yeah. technology developments can be very usefully, or consumer behavior changes can be very usefully stimulated uh, by commitments to just limit what you're willing to do on the supply side and to take off the table certain categories of actions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I certainly think that we are we are a little bit away from from seeing seeing this play out um the the challenge for many companies still um that have like global complicated uh, supply chains is that they are yet at the stage of being able to trace what they buy back down to you know the farmers so they are still in this um fact finding exercise uh, which very quick quickly needs to translate into you know action and, and disincentivization of, of the deforestation so i think you know uh, yeah we hopefully we'll, we'll see some acceleration coming on this and hopefully that the market forces um yeah make um make it balance and, and achieve that target so um let me bring our conversation back down to what's going on in the uk and uh, we have seen the recent announcement of of the consent for the cambrian coal mine so how does this reconcile with the phasing out of coal? How, uh, what's your the, take? the consent for the Cumberland coal mine is one of the most single idiotic decisions I've seen a UK government make in decades. I think it's completely unjustified. It's completely mad. Um, now, you could argue, you know, caveat emptor, caveat investor. You know, the people who've invested in this um, mine, they're going to lose money. Um, you know, that's their problem. But there are two problems with what has happened. One, this has blown the UK's credibility apart. Um, we have been leading the argument to phase down coal. And then we say we're going to a, a, a license a new coal mine. I mean, if you think that the uh, UK can have a credible role in international negotiations uh, about coal phase out from now on. You're, you're just deluding yourself about you know, how the world uh, works. So it's a huge setback to our credibility, which was very high. The argument made is that this mine is producing metallurgical coal, coking coal as it's called, used as the reduction agent in iron uh, making. And I have seen completely stupid, ludicrous statements from some people saying, we do not know how to make steel without coking coal. Well, that is definitively, absolutely, idiotically wrong. And if anybody tells you that, they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, the work we have done, uh, and I would ask you all, if you want to look at the Mission Possible Partnerships site and look at the Sector Transition Strategy 
for iron and steel making, signed off by a lot of uh, big uh, steel companies, including Tata, uh, who, of course, have um, uh, half of the UK's entire uh, uh, steel making production, um, uh, iron making production. Uh, that report, that sector transition strategy, clearly sees that the blast furnace, the blast furnace using coking coal is a dying technology. It will take time to die because of the capital stock turnover effect. And what you will probably do is the existing blast furnaces of the world will run till the point at what you, we call relining, uh, the point at which you have to invest significantly to keep them going. And at that point, if not before, they will move to new technologies. Those new technologies could include going rapidly uh, directly to hydrogen direct uh, reduction. Uh, they could also include going through an intermediate stage of using uh, methane, uh, methane, which is uh, split down into the syngas elements of uh, carbon monoxide, CO, uh, and hydrogen, which are then uh, both used as the reduction agents in steel production. But basically, what has happened over the last five years is a revolution in the possibility of producing zero carbon steel. Um, five years ago, I thought the future of steel was keep doing blast furnaces, but add carbon capture and storage. That, I think, is a, a, a vision whose time has passed. We are going to move to new technologies. So the fact that we have managed to blow our international climate credibility in order to invest in a technology which is a dying old historic technology, uh, that is why I think this is about mm -hmm. the stupidest decision I've seen in a long time. Right. Okay, so I'm just conscious of our time and um, there's a lot more questions we, me and the audience would like to ask you, but I, I'll um, just do a last one, which um, I think with your background in the financial sector would be um, really good to have your view on <clears throat> what is the role of the financial sector of financial systems in, in this transition to net zero? Look, I think the financial systems can play a very strong but supporting role. What do I mean by a strong role? I think it is very valuable that across the world we have many financial institutions, both asset managers, insurance companies, pension firms, which provide equity and other forms of investment, and banks, which provide loans, all signing up to net zero targets. Now, once they've signed up, it's a great challenge to work out how to operationalize those because, of course, when an individual steel company or aviation company says, I'm on a net zero pathway, um, at least in relation to their scope one and scope two, you know, they can measure it, they can decide uh, how to do it, they're directly in control of what they're doing. A, a financial institution, of course, is trying to look through uh, all the investments and it loans it makes to everything that all of its counterparties are doing. That's a much more complicated challenge. But financial institutions throughout the world are doing it. We're working in particular closely with one very major bank throughout the world trying to work through what does that commitment mean in terms of what we shouldn't finance and what we should finance? How do we really work out what our refinanced emissions are? How fast can they come down? All of that is uh, very valuable. And I think it's very important for responsible financial institutions to play that responsible role, both on what I call the negatives and the, the positives. The negatives do not finance any new coal developments. Be very cautious about oil and gas. Make sure that what you're doing is consistent uh, with a science-based target of reduction of oil and gas. Do invest, do help uh, renewables, new technologies, all of that's very important. The only thing I want to say is never think that it is a substitute for government policies. The heavy lifting of the path to net zero will always have to be done with carbon prices, with bans on internal combustion engines, with government support for new technologies, with regulation. Because if you don't have them there, then one of those financial institutions or companies which is doing the right thing, will find it under itself undercut uh, by the companies and financial institutions which are doing the wrong thing. So we can never substitute, we can add to, uh, we can complement, but we can never substitute for those hard government policies of 
carbon pricing, appropriate taxation, appropriate regulation, appropriate uh, initial support for new carbon technologies. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm afraid we have to close the session with that. Um, I would like to first thank you so much, Lord, Lord Turner, for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your vision for the future and um, the work that um, the Energy Transition Commission um, is doing. I think it's great to see that achieving the goal is economically and technically possible. Now it's about getting all the players going quickly in the same direction. So I'd like to remind our audience, um, our audience, uh, amongst which we have um, many decision makers and, and key representatives of, of uh, a great number of organizations that we all have the possibility to drive this, this change um, within, within our organizations, as well as, you know, within our lives as individuals and consumers and voters, right? So I hope that um, this session and uh, the next panel and the breakout discussions today um, offer um, us all a good opportunity to be inspired and to be energized and ready for accelerating the change. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.